Thank you, Lord. Good morning. Good morning. Every time I stand here, it feels like I'm about to write an exam. <laughs> <laughs> Glory to God. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you for your word, which is life and amen. Your word, which is yea and amen. Lord, speak to us this morning. Open our eyes. Open our hearts. Give us a listening ear. Give us understanding into your word this morning. Let all men be liars and let God be true this morning. Thank you, blessed Redeemer. Spirit of the living God, we hand it over to you. Let it be all about you, Lord Jesus, in this place this morning. Thank you, blessed Redeemer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Um, in the past few months, we, we've been looking at the nature or attributes of God. And um, first and foremost, it's important that we note that human beings were not created to understand who God is. We don't, we don't have the capacity to know and understand who God really is. But Isaiah 55, verse 8 to 9, says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But the merciful God, he gives to us whatever he wants us to know about him. He reveals himself to us through his spirit and through his words. In the past few months, we've seen God as the creator of all things. We've seen God as being all-powerful and all-knowing. Last week, we saw God as the judge of the whole universe. Today, we'll be looking at God as a merciful God. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but the more we dig deeper into this series, the more I stand in awe of this magnificent Amen. God that we serve. Amen. I've tried to break the sermon this morning into four. So we'll be looking at the general form of mercy. We will look at mercy of God in the life of a believer. We will look at the psalmist's perspective of God's mercy, and then our response to God's mercy. Amen. I checked out the definition of mercy, good old Google. <laughs> <laughs> and um, mercy is defined as forgiveness that is shown towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish them or harm them. But the truth is the mercy of God goes deeper than this definition. The mercy of God is all about showing kindness to those who are suffering by bringing healing to the sick, bringing comfort to people who are grieving, alleviating suffering for people who are suffering, and showing care and concern for those who are in any form of distress, despite our sinful nature. Well, we've had it already this morning. All have sinned. All. There is no exception. Big, small, all have sinned. And I want to thank God for his mercies because if it had not been for the mercies of God, humanity would have been lost forever. Yeah. Oh, what do I mean by that? Yes, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God in Genesis 3, it brought death spiritual and physical death. But the mercy of God brought salvation to rescue us from eternal damnation. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 22, in verse 22 he says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. 
as believers, there is restoration of connectivity between you and God. And when we pass on to glory, we will be with God in eternity. We will escape the second death. The mercy of God through the finished work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ensures that physical death just opens another glorious chapter for us as believers. This is, however, not so if, you're, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Despite our rebellious nature, God's response to sin is a consistent blend of judgment and mercy. God is so holy that he cannot turn away from sin. He has to judge sin. But the beautiful thing about the Most High is that in the midst of that judgment, he shows mercy. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. An example is when Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 3, and God judged them. But he didn't just leave them like that. Mercy. The mercy of God came when God decided to clothe them. He didn't leave them like that. He clothed them. Genesis 3.21, you will see that there. When, Cain, when God banished Cain from human society for slaying his brother Abel, the mercy of God ensured that Cain was not killed. He put a mark on him. You will see that in Genesis 4.15. Now, despite the fact that these people sinned and God judged them for their sins, God's ultimate intention for the well-being of humanity is never in doubt. I'm going to quickly go straight to general mercy. Now, everyone, both believers and unbelievers, enjoy God's mercy because, first and foremost, he created us in his image and likeness. That's it. So you enjoy the mercy of God in one form or the other. The psalmist in Psalm 145 verse 9 says, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works. The Lord is good to all. Now can I congratulate you for making it here today, as well as all those watching from home. You are alive here, not because of your strength or wisdom or any intellectual ability of yours or your financial status. You are alive and here today because every day is a gift from God, Amen. because he is merciful. And you will agree with me that not all who went to bed last night made it to this morning. Matthew 5 from verse 45b says, For God has made his son to rise on the evil and on the good. He sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. Now, in case you have any iota of doubt in your mind about the possibility of God putting a separation between his people and those who are not his people, can I draw your attention to the book of Exodus? Time will not permit me to read through what happened in that account. If you look at Exodus from verse 7 up down till verse 10, you will see how God the mercy of God brought freedom to the children of Israel from 430 years of slavery. And what did how God, the Almighty God in his wisdom, decided to use 10 plagues, 10 plagues to break Pharaoh's resistance before he decided to let the children of Israel go free. First of all, he turned their waters, the rivers, the pools, the streams, he turned that, that into blood. Next, frogs in the land. They left the seas and they were all over the place in the land of Egypt. There was lice. There was flies. Their, their livestock all died. There was boils on people and animals. There was hailstones. He sent locusts. He sent darkness. And then ultimately he sent the death of the firstborn of every son of the Egyptians. Actually, let's look at... Um, let me just quickly read through um, from verse Exodus. Exodus, there we go. Yeah, Exodus chapter 10, from verse 21 to 23. 
And the Lord And the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out thy hands towards the heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hands towards the heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. Verse 23, such that they saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But the beauty of it all is that all the children of Israel in the land of Goshen, there in Egypt, had light in their dwellings. Do not take the mercy of God for granted. This was actually an adumbration. It was a prototype of what was going to happen again. It's going, it has happened before. It's going to happen again. We heard it last week. That judgment is coming. Both the high and the mighty. All these people we hear these days, Putin and Biden and all these people, they will stand before the most high God. On that day, we heard it last week, if your name was not found in the Lamb's book of life, that is eternal separation from the most high God. Brothers and sisters, if you are here and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've heard it before, you've heard it again this morning, do not let this chance go pass you by. I'm going to go straight to the mercy of God. I'll come back to that again. Mercy of God in the life of a believer. Now every man born of woman inherits the sin nature of Adam and Eve. And the first human, they are the first humans created by God in Genesis 3. This rebellious nature is just something we just inherit, even from birth. Little babies know how to get angry. For those of you who have children, they know how to get angry. Even, you know, even before they know how to talk, they know how to get angry. It is that rebellious nature that we've inherited from Adam and Eve. Now, although God is fiercely holy, but his merciful nature ensures that we grow up to become who he wants us to be. So even when we are not conscious of it, God's mercy is constantly at work in our lives as believers. Now, our God is not a wicked father who is looking for those who are not living right so he can punish them. But he's constantly making ways for those who are not living right to come to repentance and obtain mercy. God is calling you this morning. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, he is calling you this morning to come. Now, looking at some of the relevant characters in the Bible, like Moses, David, Paul, Peter, and the rest of them, all of them had flaws, just like us. And humanly speaking, if you really look at them, none of them qualify to be used by God. So are you. So am, so am I. I mean, Romans 9, 16 says, It's not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but it is of God that showeth mercy. The mercies of God qualifies the unqualified like you, like me. Now, I'll just quickly look at David, run through the life history of David. David, a quick look at the life of David, shows that as the last born of the family of eight, he, David did not enjoy the pampering that last borns normally enjoy from, from what we read in, in, in the scriptures. Um, for some strange reasons, the father decided to send David to look after the sheep out there in the fields. And when God wanted to choose for himself a king, he sent Samuel, the prophet, to Jesse's house to anoint the next king after Saul's disobedience. Well, Saul disobeyed God, and God decided to choose a different king. Now, humanly speaking, even one of the greatest prophets of Israel didn't see David. He didn't think of David. Now, when he saw the firstborn, Eliab, who was big and strong, Samuel taught in his heart. He taught in his heart, oh, surely this must be God's chosen one. You see that account in 1 Samuel 16, verse 6. But the Lord said to him, look not at his countenance or his height or stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh at the outward appearance, but God looketh at the heart. God is looking at the heart. What is in your heart this morning? Where is your heart this morning? 
where is my heart this morning, even standing here and talking this morning, where is my heart? Now, after presenting all the seven brothers of David to Samuel, none of them was chosen. But God decided to choose the least qualified in the sight of men and made him king. The mercies of God chose David among all his brothers. It spoke on behalf of David. I've written down here. But God saw something in the heart of David that was absent in his other brothers. And God made the last born to be king. Even though David's father, Jesse, did not see David as king material. He didn't see him as one who qualified to be king. Why? Because he had to be reminded after all the first seven have been rejected. And Samuel said to him, are these all your children? The father wasn't even thinking of David. This is how it is. In the sight of men, you don't qualify, but in the sight of God, the mercies of God ensures that you are qualified. Amen. Amen. Now relegated to look after the sheep, David learned to depend on God for safety. The mercies of God kept him safe. And David was able to declare to Saul in 1 Samuel 17, from verse 34 to 37, when he was about to face Goliath, he said, The Lord that delivered, delivered me out of the paw of the lions and out of the paw of the bears, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine, Goliath. God, through his mercies, delivered David from Goliath. There was, humanly speaking, there was no way, no way David would have been able to beat that warrior. But it wasn't all about David. It has nothing to do with David. It was all about God, the mercies of God in the life of that king called David. The mercies of God gave David victory over Goliath, and Saul became envious of David and began to chase him all around the caves and wanting to kill him. And David was running and hiding from one cave to the other, but the mercies of God kept David safe from Saul. And when Saul died and David began to reign as king, he went off track and committed adultery. In his, in his attempt to hide it, he committed murder by asking Joab, one of his army commanders, to put Uriah the Hittite, the husband of Bathsheba, the woman whom David slept with, in the hottest part of battle, he got killed because David's men withdrew from Uriah and he was killed. You see that account in 2 Samuel 14 to 17. This is the thing about sin. The more you get into it, the more you try to look for lies to cover up. It's important that we confess our sins as believers straight away. Don't, don't hide it. If you hide it, it will grow to something bigger. Amen. Amen. Now, humanly speaking, by all human standards, a man like David is not fit to be king. How can someone who committed adultery, how can someone who just committed murder, how can that person be used by God? Mercy. God doesn't see the way we see, I'm afraid. He sees the heart. There is something about God and the way he does his things. His ways are past finding out. We cannot understand who God is and the way he does his things. Amen. But it was mercy of God that chose David out. And that's as if that's not enough. Now David, when he repented and God restored him, the Almighty God decided to bring Jesus through the lineage of David. How can we explain that? Mercy. The mercy of God. Now, as we journey through life, I've written down here, God has carved a path for us as believers. Sometimes we are tempted and we stray away. But when we come to realization of ourselves and repent, the mercies of God will bring us back on track and restore us. Now, the question for me and for you this morning is, are you walking in the path carved for you by God? Just pause and think about that for a moment. Or are you, you are walking on the path carved out for yourself. 
I cannot answer that question. I will have to answer this question for myself as well. Now, the good thing is if you have strayed away from the path God carved out for you, you can cry out to God for mercy, and he will restore you back on track. Because mercy is what will get you to the finish line in our journey of life as believers. And when we come to the end, as Paul, in 2 Timothy 4, 7, we can say, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it is dangerous. It is a very, very dangerous thing for God to take his mercies away from an individual. When the presence of God left King Saul and God took his mercies away from Saul because of, of course, the sin of disobedience, Saul became mentally unstable and God rejected him as king. What happened? He died alongside three of his sons on the same day in the battlefield. We see that account in 1 Samuel 31 verse 8. In the book of Judges, Samson was raised by God to be a Nazarite, and he was endowed with extraordinary strength. And God used Samson to deliver Israel from 40 years of oppression from the Philistines. Now, in one of his exploits, he uprooted a city gate and carried it on his shoulder all the way to a hill. You see that in Judges 16 from verse 1 to 3. Now I'm yet to find any person with such power. But Samson kept straying away from the path carved out to him by God. Now the final straw was when he violated one of the laws that made him a Nazarite by allowing his hair to be shaved. Judges 16, 7. And the presence of God left him and the mercies of God was taken away from Samson. And what happened? The Philistines caught him and plucked out his eyes. Sad, very sad. And the, 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 the sad part of this account was that he did not know that he was now out of the path carved out for him by God. Because when Delilah, the Philistine girl, Samson fell in love with, woke him up after his hair was shaved, he said to himself, I will go out as other times and shake myself and the Bible says he knew not that the presence of God had left him. This is the thing about sin. It comes slowly. You begin to compromise slowly. It doesn't matter. You begin to allow little, little foxes to creep in. And before you know it, you will not know that the anointing of God, the presence of God, the mercies of God is gone from you. That will not be our portion in Jesus' name. He became very powerless because, of course, the power of God left him and his eyes. He lost his eyes and they threw him in prison and he was grinding there. But the beautiful part of that account in verse 22 was that, in verse 22 of Judges 16, is that his hair began to grow again. That speaks about restoration. And something, verse 28, let me just quickly read that part. It says, verse 28 of um, Judges 16, it says, Something cried out to God for mercy and prayed. And God restored his strength back to him. Brothers and sisters, I don't know where you are in your Christian walk with God. And if you have gone off track like something, you can cry out to God for mercy. And God will restore you. The Bible says in, in the scriptures, everyone that cried out to God for mercy received mercy. Everyone. You cry out genuinely to God for mercy, he will show you mercy. Because it is his nature to show mercy. He said in his word, I will show mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. You see that in Exodus 13, 19. That's what he told Moses. In Romans 9, 15, that account is there as well. Now, God is sovereign and does as he pleases, but he shows mercy to anyone who generally cry out to him. Now, the cry for mercy is a desperate cry for help. I will liken it to someone drowning in the sea. Now, it's not a kind of cry where you make excuses. It's a desperate cry. Somebody who is drowning is not there saying, oh, actually, I didn't, um, 
I underestimated how deep this part of the water is. No, 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 no. He wasn't saying that. Every attempt, because each time the water brings the person up, the only thing you want to say is help. You're crying out for help. And that's how desperate, that is how the desperate people cry out. When you cry out for God, you are not making excuses. You're just saying, Lord, this is me. Have mercy on me. Remember Peter, when Peter walked on water, Matthew 14, that when the Lord ordered him to come and Peter was walking on water, in verse 30, the Bible says he took his eyes away from the Lord and he began to sink. And what did he do? He cried out, save me, Lord. And the Lord grabbed him and, and said to him, why did you doubt? Keep your eyes on Jesus as believers. Keep focus. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will remain on track. And by so doing, you will get to the finish line. Amen. Amen. One of the greatest privileges we enjoy as believers is that like, it's like markings on the roads. For those of us who drive, there are markings. Those markings, as long as you remain on your track, you will not leave. You cannot just leave your your lane into another lane, you'll be causing problems there. Yeah, but so there are markings to keep it. Again, just like or like railings on bridge. They are there for a reason. They are there to keep you so that you don't fall over the bridge. They are there for a reason. And God in his infinite mercies has put his Holy Spirit on us. When he saved us, he didn't leave us alone. He put his Holy Spirit in us to keep us on track. Very important. He didn't save us and just left you on your own. No. He put his Holy Spirit in you to keep you on track. Because for by strength shall no man prevail. On our own, we're just, it's just hopeless. We, we, cannot, we cannot make it. So we need the Spirit of God in us to lead us daily. This is very important. Temptations will come. And the Lord already knows about all this. Temptations will come. But the Spirit of God will sound those warning bells. The Spirit of God will sound those warning bells. Before you stray away, you will hear. If you decide to ignore those warnings, then I'm afraid there is a price to pay. Even though you will be saved, even though when you cry to God, he will restore you. But whatever it is you've done, the consequence you have to bear. Samson lost his eyes. He was restored. When he cried, God, the Lord restored him. But he was left with no eyes. This is why it's very, very important for us not to ignore the warning signs of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yes, amen. Now, David as king had power. He had the power to put prophet Nathan, who exposed him of his adultery, to death. Because he was the king. He had the power to say, right, I'm going to kill you for telling me that. How dare you? No, not David. The Bible says he repented and cried out to God for mercy. Psalm 51. And the mercy of God restored him. My question for us this morning is, as believers, when you stray away, are you humble enough to receive correction? Do you cry out to God for mercy when you stray away? Because God is ever willing to bring us back on track. But you have to cry out to God for mercy. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Mercy is available this morning. Now, one of the relevant characters in the Bible who enjoyed God's mercy was David. He understood that it is in God's nature to show mercy. And in Psalm 136, the statement for his mercies endured forever was repeated 26 times. David understood the mercies of God. So we're going to look at Psalm 103. I'll just take the first 11 verses and just run through that for sake of time. Psalm 103, just to drive home the point that we're making this morning. 
I'm, I'm using the KJV version, and, and it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Amen. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thy iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction, who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfieth thy mouth with good things, so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executeth righteousness and judgment for all that are oppressed. He made known his ways unto Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. He had not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is as high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. Can you say amen? amen? Thank you, Lord. Now, verse 1, David, 103, Psalm 103 just drives home the point I've been trying to make. Verse 1 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Now, the psalmist speaks to himself, asking the core of his being to bless the Lord. Now, as believers, every time we think of the mercies of God, and how good God has been to us, it's important for us to bless his holy name from the core of our being with everything in us because God is merciful. Verse number two says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now the message of God provides benefits. Number one, he forgiveth all our sins. The message of God brought salvation to us as believers through the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He takes away all our sins and gives us his righteousness. Number two, it says he healeth all thy diseases. Now sin is the greatest disease of mankind, and the blood of Jesus is the only thing that can bring healing from that sting of sin. And God indeed have the capacity to heal all your diseases if he chooses to. God is sovereign. He does as he pleases. And this was David speaking many years before the Lord Jesus Christ was to come. Number three, it says redemption of your life from destruction. He keeps you from the grave and surrounds you with his loving kindness and tender mercies. Benefit number four, he supplies all our needs and renews our strength. Number five, he fights our battles and judges those who oppress us. Thank you, Lord. From verse eight to nine, he says, The Lord is merciful, gracious, slow to anger, and plenteous in mercy. The mercies of God means that he is long-suffering. In 2 Peter 3, 9, says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he is long-suffering to us, to us what? not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, you must have heard some people say things like, why is there so much evil in the world? If there is a God, judgment should fall on those people. People who are evil should be destroyed. Why are they committing all sorts of atrocities? If there is a God, he should, surely he should be able to deal with these people and, and everything they are doing. But God is not a man. He doesn't see the way men see. God is merciful, and his ways are not our ways. But he gives people long enough time to repent. By the way, those who are asking those questions will be the first to be judged, because they are guilty as well of the same sin. All of us, we are guilty, every one of us. Verse number 10, it says he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Thank God for that. Can you imagine if God will deal with us the way we, the way we behave sometimes? By the way, in the Old Testament, there was a king called Herod. He refused to give glory to God. He was eaten up by worms straight away. Judgment came. But mercy... Mercy of God speaks for us. Thank God for his mercies. 
The Bible says he doesn't punish us as we deserve. Psalm 106, verse 44 to 46 says, Whenever God hands over the children of Israel, I just paraphrase that. Every time the children of Israel go astray, they veer off the track God has created for them, he hands them over to their enemies for a few lessons. They teach them a few lessons, and when they cry out to him, he saves them because he is merciful. He rescues them. Verse 11 says, For as high as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards them that fear him. There is nothing to compare the mercy of God towards us as believers. Now, it does not matter how far away you've strayed or drifted away from that path God carved out for you this morning. If you cry out to him genuinely for mercy, he will show you mercy because it is his nature to show mercy. What should be our response this morning to the mercy of God? Matthew 5, 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Now, as people who have received so much mercy from God, he expects us to show mercy. God expects us to show mercy to other people. Now, looking at David, despite all the plans, the evil plans Saul, the king, had for David, when David had the opportunities to kill Saul, he showed mercy. First was First Samuel 24, from verse 4 to 6. The second time, First Samuel 26, from verse 8 to 11. David had the opportunity to kill Saul. But David showed mercy. And when David began to reign as king, instead of wipe out completely anything that had to do with Saul, we see David in 2 Samuel 9.1 saying, Is there yet any left of the house of Saul that I may show him mercy for Jonathan's sake? David understood that he is, he was who he was at that time because of the mercy of God. And he understood that fact, and that's why he showed mercy. Now, what would be our response? The parable of the unmerciful servant, Matthew 18, 21 to 35, reminds us of the need to show mercy. Now, we did not qualify to get anything from God. And we deserve death because of our rebellious nature against God. But that was all before we came to God. But when, when we cried out to the Lord for mercy, the great exchange took place on the cross. Christ died on the cross instead of you and I and gave us his righteousness. Now, this was the greatest act of mercy you will ever hear of. The great exchange on the cross. The Lord Jesus Christ took my sin, took your sin, nailed it to the cross, and looked at us and said, you are forgiven. Mercy. Now, the Lord is not like the earthly judges. You know, in the court of law, when you plead guilty, they, they will consider you, you know, they softening things for you. But that's not the same with the Lord. If you cry out to God for mercy, he wipes everything completely and gives you a new beginning. Amen. This is the Lord we're talking about. He gives you a new beginning. God is not like man who... Oh, amen. Let me just go on. <laughs> he wipes up. So we, we've been forgiven. Like, like this, uh, time will not allow me to go into um, the parable of the unmerciful servant. But read that account in Matthew 18, 21 to 35. Um, God has forgiven us a lot. So he expects us to forgive other people. Yeah? But it, um, brothers and sisters, what is the lesson there? I noticed that he was speaking to Peter. He was speaking to Peter. So if that was relevant to the disciples, this is relevant to us. So that's probably he's speaking to us. And Peter asked him, how many times shall we forgive those who hurt us? And Jesus told Peter 70 times, 70 times, 70 times, 7 times. So that's about 490 times. Now some translations say 77 times. Now the bottom line is, as children of God, we must not keep record of wrongdoings against us. I hear some people sometimes say, that's the third time you are doing that to me. No. No. We're children of God. We must be different. We cannot keep record of wrong. 
Remember when you came to the Lord Jesus Christ, he wiped everything completely and gave you a new beginning. If you want to be a true child of God, as he expects you to be, you must show mercy. He expects it from us. Amen. God expects us to show mercy and forgive those who hurt us on a limited number of times. Do not keep record. Now, this does not make you a doormat Christian. So I've written down here. Uh, it just makes you become more Christ-like. That's all it does for you. And I know, I do understand that some of us have been hurt badly by people, people we trust. And I, I know I've spoken about this here before. But maybe the Lord wants some, to free somebody here or somebody listening at home. The Lord wants to set you free this morning. So forgive other people so that God will forgive you. Now, if you refuse to show mercy, verse 35, God will withdraw mercy from you if you refuse to show mercy. Now, if you're struggling with unforgiveness, cry out to God for mercy. Help is available to you this morning. For you, non-believers, if you're here and you're still struggling, you're still thinking about it, whether to go to the Lord, whether to give your life to Christ or not, you're thinking about it. If you're watching on the internet or you're here, you're not here by accident. The mercy of God had brought you here so that he will set you free. Free from the wrath to come. Amen. Now God is calling you just as you are. All you need to do is to cry out to God for mercy. Now you may never get another chance. I've written down here. No one is assured of tomorrow. Like the wise, oh, I almost called him the good thief. Like the wise thief. Like the wise thief on the cross in Luke 23, 39 to 43, he asked Jesus for mercy. And right there on the cross of condemnation, he escaped hell. Right there on the cross, he escaped hell. While the foolish thief paid dearly for it. You may never get another chance. This might just be your chance. Do not leave this place without settling it out with the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him your heart. Give him your life. Make him Lord of your life. And it shall be well with you. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we just thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you, Lord, because you are a good God. And it doesn't matter how we think, what we think or what we say or what we do. You are a good God. And that, what we think, don't change you, Lord. Because you are who you are. You are the most high. If there is anyone here still struggling with unforgiveness or anyone who has been hurt, Lord, would you touch them this morning and heal them and make them whole. Draw them to yourself, O oh God. Give them the grace to let go of any hurt and just keep us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, blessed Redeemer, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.